Study Manual, Volume 2, The Revelation of Christ. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Yes, and repent of all your sins now. <laughs> okay, we're doing good so far. <laughs> we're in the Word. <laughs> all right. Um, I've been told that we stopped on the last paragraph at the bottom of page 18. So let's go ahead and just read a little bit of that. And this is talking about Jesus as a stranger. They, they knew so much of him, speaking of the disciples, and when taking this journey, something had changed about him. And uh, many of you students were here for uh, Brother Lumen's sharing. And one of the things that he told about, and, and I mean, I only heard two of the classes, but that he mentioned both times and went into detail, was his experience of coming to a revelation of Christ, which is real precious, frankly, because he usually doesn't talk about that kind of stuff. And in that, he had mentioned how many years he had been a minister, preached, you know, in pulpits, served the Lord, and then God did this completely different work that opened his eyes, just like we're talking about Luke 24, after he'd known Jesus, after he'd been saved, after he'd functioned um, in, in the gifts of the Spirit. And um, my experience is similar to that. Um, I had worked for years with Kenneth Copeland, or for a year, a little less than that actually, with Kenneth Copeland. And this is when he was, he wasn't world famous. <clears throat> he was uh, an evangelist for a little church in Fort Worth, and I don't even know how I got hooked up with him, but this was before he, this is before he got big and little. Here's what I mean. Before he got big, famous, and little physically. Because when I met him, the man was huge. And most people don't believe me, but Kenneth Copeland was huge. And now he's this little skinny guy and stayed that way. Um, you know, we got to see a lot of miracles. We got to see the Lord do a lot of things. But I also, because I was working on his uh, uh, intercessory prayer team, got to see prayer requests come in from some of those people who got healing or from some of the families of people who got a miracle and found that a lot of people that get what they want from the Lord don't continue with the Lord as strong as they did when they were after something from the Lord. <clears throat> the revelation of Christ is not about gaining something for us. In fact, in a certain sense, it's about loss in the sense of what John the Baptist put it. He must increase and I must decrease. Now, is there anybody that loves Jesus? Hello. <laughs> and is there anybody that loves Jesus with all your heart that wouldn't want Jesus to increase? Does anybody want Jesus to increase? Well, guess what? The scriptures say that doesn't just say you must want him to increase. It says you must decrease. Okay. And, and why? What, is, what would be your purpose for that? Well, because we preach some mean, hard gospel. Or, or because we, we just like slinging the cross around or something. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying. It, what, is, what would be the purpose? I'll tell you exactly what the purpose is that Christ may increase. The only reason that I personally would even consider a decrease of me would be because Jesus is so much greater, so much more beautiful, so much better, so much more than me that I am willing to decrease if only he could increase in my life, in this world, in this church, in your life, whatever, to whatever degree that can happen. This world is dark. Christians 
fail God and come short. Christians mess up, but Jesus formed in you will do things that you can't do. Jesus will will in you things that you're not willing. And half of the blessing to the Father isn't just that now you're willing by Christ, but now it's Christ in you that's making you willing. In other words, he looks and sees the Son, and he says, there's my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's not just going, now they're doing what I want. You see what I mean? I mean, a dictator can do that. Pharaoh can do that. But his heart is not the heart of a Pharaoh. He knows that Christ is our hope. He set up the plan. And it wasn't just hope for salvation one day. Yeah, you know, that's great. But see, I found the Lord when I was in my early 20s. And I was a mess when I found the Lord. I'd been a hippie, been selling drugs, been, you know, all sorts of stuff. And <clears throat> when I found Jesus, I knew I was saved, but I could still tell that I was pretty messed up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That just getting saved didn't magically make everything go away. And I, and I said, golly, I thought this was the answer. And in my heart, it bore witness. Jesus is the answer. I believe that then, and I believe it now. But I was seeing that salvation. See, I was saying Jesus is the answer, but in reality, I was believing that salvation from hell was the answer. You see the difference? I mean, you say Jesus is the answer, but really what you're talking about is when you received Jesus and he saved you from hell. Jesus, the life, is the answer to life. And that's why the front of this is called Christ as life. Somebody asked me about that. They usually do. Why doesn't it just say uh, Christ is life? They said that. Why don't you just say Christ? Why do you say Christ as life? And I said, because every Christian that there is believes Christ is life. You go up to them. It doesn't matter. They can live the most carnal existence. They can be hanging on by a thread, and you ask them, is Christ, Christ is life, right? And they go, oh, yeah. But then when you start talking about, do you know Christ as life, as your life? Well, no, he lives in me. But who lives? Well, me. He's, I consult him from time to time. And he's one of the best consultants I've ever had. Glory, glory. Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't come to be a consultant. He came to be, be the length and the breadth, the, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and everything in between. And praise God, he's got that right. You know, he comes in, a, I mean, folks, if just salvation from hell or from punishment was what it was all about, he wouldn't have had to come inside of us. That's why you accepted him inside. You may not have realized it when you did it, you know, but the reason why you accepted him inside was for life now. You accepted his work in relationship to your eternal future but you accepted his life because you need life. A lot of people don't tell you that. They just go, okay, well, part of salvation is, you know, pray this prayer, I'm sorry for my sins, and, you know, forgive me, and, you know, I want to go to heaven. And now ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus, come into my heart. And it's like, it's almost like we open a little room, let Jesus in there, shut the door, and then sort of visit when we're in the mood or when we're spiritual. You know. So this is, I'm saying all this, you say, my God, Randy, you barely finish a sentence and then you talk for 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm saying all this to say what these disciples need, what these <coughs> disciples want is Jesus in a greater way, but they're not fully aware of their need Folks, there is so much more of Jesus than any of us 
put together, all of us put together, has. Do you know that? If we knew half of what we could have, we would be running after Jesus. We would love him with all of our heart, soul, and strength. So we have to admit, like these disciples, we don't even know what we don't know. So that, that causes a completely different kind of prayer. And that kind of prayer is, Lord, I limit you. Lord, I see within small, narrow avenues of truth that have been given to me by religion. Lord, kick out the walls. Kick out the walls. Just ask him to do that. Just ask him. Now, he may not do it instantly, but you gave him permission, and so he's got to work. You know, we're, we're, we're a little bit like a chess game because we'll make a move towards him, then he'll make a move towards what we want, then we'll make another move away from him or, or towards something else. And then he's got to, instead of making the next move that would have helped us, he's got to make a move to block us from going there. You know, so a journey like the children of Israel in the wilderness took them 40 years. The Bible tells us that was actually an 11 day journey from Egypt to the promised land. What would have taken 11 days. It took them 40 years. Now, how many wanted to spend the next 40 years goofing off, you know, playing at it? Was God with them? Yeah, he was with them in the wilderness. Was God doing miracles? He certainly was. But they were dropping like flies in the wilderness and never entering into the fullness that God had in the promised land. So we don't want to be like them. Not based on I want to be somebody or I want to do something great or whatever. That, I believe those things will follow you. You know, if you're sold out to Jesus, if you're in love with Jesus, if you're part with him, then he, he can use you any way he wants. And if he uses you in great and fantastic ways, you will be of such a heart that you will always give him the glory. But if you're just after that stuff, or somebody says, oh, praise God, you, you did this, this great thing, and you know, and you'll, something inside of you will go, yeah, I'm, I'm good, you know, or I'm holy, or I'm righteous, or I'm special, or I'm, you know. <clears throat> you don't have to be special. Well, let me give you, those that aren't married here, let me give you a little secret. If you got a poor self-image, the best thing that will get you over that is not getting a good self-image. For example, if you're a girl and you have a poor self-image, get a guy that thinks you're the best. I'm talking Song of Solomon right now. Anybody know the story back and forth? He says, thou art fair, thou art, you know, and she's going, you know, I'm black and I'm, you know, ugly and I'm this and that. Well, that's because you've been looking at yourself instead of looking at yourself through my eyes. So continually he's saying to her what he sees, and what he sees, he's the head. So what he sees is what's important. So you surrender your will, you surrender your identity to his eyes. Right? I mess up too much. I fail people. I hurt people. I do this and that. I... You know, I can't get over this. I don't know what's wrong with me. Look into his eyes and he will speak to you. And when you hear him, he will see you through the cross and through the resurrection. He will not see you as you see yourself because most of what you see is something that was crucified. That's right. Something that you're trying to get over, he killed. You know, it's kind of like training a mad, angry pit bulldog and, go, you know, and trying to train it and to talk it into being sweet. That's you talking to your old nature. <laughs> Come on, boy. <laughs> you know, rip your hand off. 
you know. You trying to repent for your pit bulldog, you trying to give it sweets, hoping that it'll get sweet, you trying to do all that is not going to work. As you look into his face, and the Bible says, as we look into his face, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. How many of you really honestly, honestly want to change? I mean, you want change in you. That's how it happens. See, we think it change, we change by coming down to the altar and giving everything up. Okay. Now, I know that doesn't work because I spent years going down to the altar and with all sincerity and tears and brokenness, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me. and I'll be the person you want me to be. And I mean, I, I remember one time I was down there and I said, this is it, I've had it, man, I'm going with you. I'm not going to, you know, that besetting sin that keeps pulling me down, it is not going to happen again. I'm yours. I'm dedicated. I'm committed. And got up and had, didn't even leave the church building before I was in it again. And just went, what is wrong with me? I had the most holy moment in my whole life, you know? I mean, I had somebody once tell me that, that somebody was praying for them and they laid hands on them and they were slain in the spirit and they laid there for 45 minutes and they said, I was pinned to the floor and I couldn't move and the spirit of God was all over me. And it was, the, it was like I was already in heaven, like angel wings were brushing across my face and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, later on I saw them and they looked terrible. I said, are you all right? What's going on? Oh man, I've had the worst week, man. I've just been messing up. I don't know what's wrong with me. I said, what happened to that holy moment or whatever? And he said, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> you know, I said, look, either, either the cross is the answer or God's going to have to the pin, is going to have to pin you to the floor for the rest of your life. Because <laughs> if you get up, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> yeah. The holy hand grenade of Antioch will do it. All right. So we need to read more than one sentence. Um, this resurrected Jesus had come in another form and appeared as a stranger to them. Before this time, they walked with a Jesus they could, they could recognize. Now they had to walk with this stranger called Jesus until they knew him. To take this journey is not to spend time with the Jesus who is familiar to us, and that's a key right there. For a while, I, nobody is going to take anything from you, but for a while, Surrender all the good stuff you think you got, all the depth and all the stuff, the spiritual stuff that makes you something special. And just sit down at the feet of Jesus like, like uh, Mary did and say, talk to me. Just allow the Holy Spirit to begin to describe the resurrected Jesus in light of you being raised with him, you being seated together with him, you not still on the earth struggling and fighting, but you in Christ and Christ in you on this earth. And that's what he said over and over, I in you and you in me. Well, he's raised, so you're in the resurrected Jesus. Him in you is the one who can overcome life's problems now. <clears throat> to take this journey is not to spend time with the Jesus who is so familiar to us. When you walk the road to Emmaus, you will walk with a stranger. There is a period of time in between Jesus' resurrection and the place of meeting him on the road to Emmaus in which you, uh, you are more sad than joyful and more empty than full. Now remember the story. Th these guys were more sad than they were joyous. They sounded empty. They sounded needy. Christians don't like to come to a place where they're empty and needy. Especially if you've had a pretty good walk, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, because the first thought that comes to our mind is, what's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? 
Well, what if nothing was wrong with you that at the moment you thought this is the worst point in your Christian life, what if this was the point where everything could change for the better, where the day dawn and day star could arise in your heart? What if that was the case? What if he actually had worked hard to get you to a place of emptiness? So that why? He could, he could be the filling. That's a good way of putting it. He could be the filling. Wow. Man, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You have a vacuum in the depths of your being that can only be filled with this stranger, so you must walk with the stranger until you know him. You feel that you need the Lord in a different way. You will have arrived at such a state so that although you love him and have laid hold of him, you realize that you hardly know him. It is this personal longing perceived by Jesus that causes him to draw near. And here's what I mean by that. They feel empty. They feel discouraged. They feel like in the exterior world of Christianity, things have gone not the way they were hoping. Does that sound like anybody? That, that in, the, in your mind you thought this was going to go another way. And so they are, they're not just slightly discouraged folks. I mean, they really believe that this Jesus of Nazareth way was going to be how it is. And folks, if it was that way, don't you think God is greater than a created being called an angel, called Lucifer, who fell, called Satan? Do you, do you believe God is greater than Satan? One is God, and another one is a created creature. Okay, so you're telling me that God cannot win the battle and that the earth is primarily dark, and there's nothing but just darkness and bad stuff going on uh, and everything. And it's because the devil is more powerful. I mean, that's, is that what you're telling me? Is you, are you telling me that after 2,000 years, he hadn't gained any more ground than this? And what I'm saying is, here's what I'm saying. If Jesus of Nazareth, if Jesus of Nazareth was the way that this thing should have gone, folks, Everywhere, in every church, in every city, in every place all over the world, there would be the children of God going around doing miracles and healings and great things happening and, and all this, and everybody would be going, this is it, Jesus is it, this is what it's about. It would have been following the way of Jesus of Nazareth. But Jesus, at a certain juncture, when they would come and make him king, when they wanted, when the whole world was ready to go after him, he said, it said, and this is all in John 12, just before he goes to the cross, it says, though he had done so many miracles among them, yet they believed not on him. Now, that is an incredible statement. Though Jesus had done so many miracles, in other words, the miracles aren't going to do it. And in that same chapter, he said, he turned. And he quit doing miracles. He only did one after that point. And that was when he healed Malchus's ear because, you know, Peter cut it off. But he didn't do any more miracles after that. He said this, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it's going to be alone. But if I die, now I'll bring forth fruit. Can you see Peter grabbing Jesus by the robe and going, what are you talking about? There's been nothing but fruit. You remember that blind man? And now he's healed. That's fruit. Remember this that, that you did? That, why was that fruit? Remember all those people you fed? That's fruit. Jesus, are you crazy? Stop talking this way. Randy, are you crazy? Stop talking this way. Folks, I've been around long enough to see it and God can do a miracle for you and you can turn right around and go your own way. He can give you everything you want and you're still not sold out to him. But Jesus knew and understood 
that we must be brought in to the death that he died, just like he did, so that we could be brought into the resurrection and be one with him in, in that. And, and what does that say? <coughs> See, we want to have power so we can cast out demons. Well, we, we have power and we can cast out demons. Amen? Isn't that right? We do. That, that's a possibility. And that's, he gave us. But that's all he used until he died and rose again. When he rose again, the Bible says this. Well, it says, it says uh, like in Ephesians 1, where Paul writes to the church and says, I've heard of your love. I've heard of your faith. But now I'm praying that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, church, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Get ready. Far above all, A-L-L, principalities and powers and mights and dominions and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Okay, so what is the difference? Paul's speaking from a resurrection view. And he's saying, his, he, Paul, Paul never said, let's just go out and cast all the demons out of everybody. A few of you have heard my explanation of that. I, I remember years ago when everybody would gather together and we'd stand together in the church and we'd, we'd cast the demons out of the city. We'd shout to the north and then we'd shout to the south and then we'd, you know, and we would, all the demons get out of this city in the name of Jesus. And, and you know, and the, everybody's excited. We're going to get all the demons out of our city and everything's going to be peaceful and everywhere is just going to be Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And I remember standing there with everybody, shouting and praying and everything. And all of a sudden it hit me, wait a minute, where are all these demons going? Yeah. They're going to somebody else's city. Well, I don't care as long as we don't have them. Is that Christianity? Is that Christ? I don't care. You know, I mean, in my opinion, if it's going to really be the Lord, let's invite them all here and then defeat them or something. But don't send them all out here and wreak them on everybody else. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, it sounds spiritual, but it's just using power to make life better or to defeat the devil instead of using character. Well, our city is called the New Jerusalem. We have been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The only place all principalities and powers and might and dominion is under our feet is because it's under his feet and we're in him. The picture I got when I saw this from the Lord was like, it says that we, we were raised up with him and made to sit together in heavenly places far above all principalities and mights. So I saw Jesus up there and his feet are dangling down, but, but he's way up there. And the devil and all the principalities are going like this. They're trying to get, you know, but, and they're going, we can't reach him. And he's not even that close. He's far above. And, but we're, you know, but we're not up there. We're down here surrounded by, I'm going, I rebuke you, and I rebuke you too, and you slimy thing, get off of me. And there's a place for that, and trust me, I know and I believe in it, and I stand with it when it's necessary, but ultimately when that's settled and you got the devil off of somebody, they need to take their place in Christ, Amen. far above. Why? Because you can cast a demon out and if you don't hold the ground, he can come back seven times worse. Amen? Yes. That, that's true. Okay, well, I want to go where he can't come back at all. Amen. In Christ. Far above. Already raised. Those scriptures, folks, all of those scriptures that I've been quoting, 
Those are all past tense. You know, I had to deal with that too. I had to deal with that too. Wait a minute. I mean, I remember reading it and going, you know, wait a minute. This is all past tense. He hath raised us up. He hath put us in Christ. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, now if I claim to, you know, because we do this all the time. I believe this book from cover to cover, from Genesis to the maps, you know. <laughs> and yet there's always sections that we, you know, that we don't. You know, Deb and I were talking with Kelly after she got back from Ireland just trying to find out what was going on. And she said, you know, somebody sat me down and said, what are you doing still single? You ought to get married. You ought to be having kids stuff. She said, well, you know, have you ever noticed what Paul said, that it's better to remain unmarried? That if you get married, you're going to have trouble in the flesh, but it's actually to remain unmarried is better? How many, honestly... How many Christians do you know, certainly in this country, but she wasn't in this country? You know, yeah, talk about trouble in the flesh. It's moving right behind us now. <laughs> I, I feel the gravitational pull even now. <laughs> Next week, at this time, it'll be here. And if you think I'm a prophet, <laughs> you'd be wrong. She's having a C-section. <laughs> but now, I mean, just for a moment of honesty, real honesty, how many Christians do you know that honestly, in their belief system of their heart, believe that it's better to be single. Every one of them believe it's better to be married. And the proof of that is when somebody, that their kid or something else doesn't get married, they're going, what's wrong with you? Well, I'm, I'm all out for Jesus. Well, that can't be right. <laughs> you know, but I believe every page of this Bible. You know? Anybody can pick up a book and shake it. <laughs> you know, what we're trying to do here is believe it. <laughs> we're, we're trying to, you know, I remember when I read that Jesus said, my doctrine is not my own. And I remember I was a fairly new Christian two or three years, and I, I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? All the doctrines I believe are my own. I chose them. In other words, when I would hear something I like, I'd go, oh, I, I like that, I believe that. If I heard something I didn't like, I'd go, ah, it can't be true. Be and how would I know it can't be true? Because I already, at three years old in the Lord, had all knowledge. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, Nobody could share anything new with me that I didn't already know I or wouldn't accept it. Does that even make sense? That's just crazy. But that's, that was my thinking. But I remember that moment thinking when Jesus, I read Jesus said, my doctrine is not my own. I said, you know what? You're right. You know, it was the Lord talking to me. You're right. I need to give up everything that I believe and I need to start believing what you believe. My doctrine is not my own, it's yours. It's what you believe, and I believe what you believe. I don't believe what I choose to believe or what, I, what tastes good to me, you know? And, you know, I, I'm glad I did that because it's, it caused me to be open to rereading the scriptures anew and afresh without reading into what I'd been taught and, and reading there and going, you know, what this is saying is not what I've always, what my doctrine, what my doctrine said that it says. And then I'd go, okay. You know that song, I'm trading my sorrows? We need to give that up. We need to start trading in our doctrines. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trading my doctrines. I'm, 
I heard in uh, New Jersey or somewhere during Valentine's Day, they had a special program where they would, if you turned in a gun, they would give you a rose. Yeah, this was an actual deal. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see how many they got, but. <laughs> well, it was Valentine's Day. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I say I got a whole truckload of roses here. <laughs> oh God! All right, let's get back on here. Let's saddle back up and get back on this horse. Man, I, I, you know, I really need to at least finish this heading here, which we started in. What is wrong with me? <clears throat> All right. Uh, we must meet the unrecognized Christ. We must meet the stranger. Before we can make more progress on this journey, the stranger whose name is Jesus must be recognized as unrecognized. As long as we think that we know, as long as we think our cup is full and we have something, we are in trouble. For we will, for we will have already obstructed the, the Spirit of God. Why? Because, like any cup, if that one was full, I said, oh, Lord, fill my cup, you know, and I, my, my cup is full of bitter tea, I mean bitter coffee, which is me, and I say, oh, sweet Jesus, you know, fill my cup with sweet tea. He's going to go, I, I, I'd like to, you know. And we sit around for days and weeks and go, I've been praying for a long time. See, bitter coffee. I've been praying for a long time for you to fill me up with your sweet tea, and you ain't doing it. <laughs> and he would say, well, you're... The problem isn't that I'm not acting. The problem is that you're full of yourself. You're still too full of you for me to be able to put any of me in there. See, a lot of what we claim is Jesus is our knowledge of Jesus, and it's not being full of Jesus. So as I've wrote here, it obstructs the Spirit of God from filling us up, and then we get upset with God because he's not working. And why isn't he working on my behalf? I asked a long time ago, and he's not doing it. You know? All right. So in this journey, there are specific circumstances that must occur to bring about God's desired results. And what will hinder these results in our lives is to think that we already have all we need. As long as we think that we hold much, then little can be given unto us. It is truly a shame for those who feel that they already know him in fullness because that stance shuts them off from knowing him even more. Amen. The truth is we know nothing yet as we ought. And I'm just quoting 1 Corinthians 8 too. And, and I, this, this is just a good stance to have in your heart at all times. You remember that the disciples, you know, the disciples when they followed Jesus, the word disciple means what? learner. They were learners, weren't they? But then they became apostles, right? But guess what? They were still called disciples. They were always called disciples. Why? Because you don't hit a certain place and go, okay, now I've got it all. I know everything. Now I'm, ready. I'm an apostle. That's scary. <laughs> I'm an apostle. I know everything. You know? Lord, send me, because I know. You know, everybody that the Lord came to and spoke to, you know, Isaiah and all of them, you know, who will go and who, you know, they're all going, don't send me, I don't know enough. You know, Jeremiah said, I'm but a child. Moses is going, I can't speak. You know, all of the great men of God, when God says, send me, says, I, I, I'm not ready, I'm too young. You know, nowadays people, you know, you hear testimonies, you know, reason why I'm a great televangelist this day is because God picked the right man. He said, who will go for me? And I said, I'll do it. I'm the one to go. I know everything. <laughs> you know? I remember one guy said that. 
I was at a conference and he got up there and he said, he says, yeah, you know, I mean, God's just shown me so much. It's all, you know, basically he didn't say I know everything, but he was saying, you know, I know, you know, so afterwards I came up and asked him a question about, you know, the scriptures and he said, uh, he said, I don't know. I said, uh, I thought, didn't you say up there you knew everything? He said, well, I do, but I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm desirous to know this stranger, and I'm willing to admit that in many ways the Jesus that I know is the earth de Jesus. I need to know this one without putting labels on him, lest I limit my understanding to just my labels. May we walk with the Lord to the end of this journey until the work has been done, that we might return and declare Jesus in newness. May we be like the disciples who left Jerusalem with one Jesus and returned with another. And you understand. Here's what I mean by that. It's the same Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but his position is different. There's a difference between walking beside you and healing and helping you and walk, you being his body. Two different positions. He's the same, but the relationship is different. Do you see what I'm saying? The relationship is different. And so what we're describing is the need to uh, let the Lord change our relationship. Well, you know, the, one of the things that, that makes, that becomes fearful to people is <clears throat> that what little they have or how much ever that they already know the Lord, that God's going to take that away from them. And I always tell people, look, you know, God's not really in the robbing business, you know. He wants to give you more. Amen. He wants to increase in you. And I tell you, if you just give him room to increase, you'll be surprised how quick you would be to, to throw out things that were just doctrines or things that weren't holding, held together by life. You know, just things that, well, this is what I taught, so I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. Um, I play devil, devil's advocate, but. Good, don't. You know what? Better <laughs> he take away what you think you know and bring you to a place of weakness that he may show you who he is. Than to compound your knowledge and you will remain dead and fucked up. Amen. Yeah. If the Lord had given you just a little more of that, I might have finished that cookie. <laughs> well, and that's right. That's exactly right. But I tell you, I understand that fear of losing what you have or the thought of losing what you have of the Lord to a whole new area that you're not even sure that that's real yet. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so it, uh, I understand that because I went through that. And it, the fear is very rare because, real because in my life, when I met Jesus, I'm, I'm not lying to you, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. The best thing. I mean, I, like I said, I was raised in an orphanage, lived in foster homes, stuff like that. Um, Sometimes lived with my parents, sometimes didn't. They both were alcoholics. Uh, just terrible, horrible things that would happen. And when I met Jesus, I knew from my spirit to my soul to my body that this was the truth and that this was real. And I was changed and I was in love with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I've been at this for, it's getting closer to 40 years now, and I am still in love with Jesus. And I mean in love. And I mean I love the Lord. I, I don't, you know, if I know something great, praise God if I know something, but I love the Lord. Amen. And I'm, I love the Lord more than I want to know the Lord. Amen. I know that sounds crazy, but my love makes me want to know him. But it's my love that drives me forward for him.
And so, so for somebody to, it's almost like, uh, like, you know, this cup represents the Jesus that I found. And I'm just going, oh, just, you know, I love you, Jesus. You know, and I know he looks better than this, but anyway. You know, and I'm just, I just, and then somebody comes up and goes, look, you know, there's, there's more, you know, and they're pulling on it, they're pulling on it, trying to take it, you know, oh, there's more and you can, you know, well, you know, do you want more of Jesus? Well, yeah, but stop it. <laughs> you know, I understand that feels like what I do have, you know, I mean, I may have to be separated from some of my doctrines, but I did find the right Jesus. And it's time to quit here, but, but I, I want you to know <clears throat> that your heart, it's like, I'll close with this. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary and said, you are going to bring forth Christ. And the Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. You know, she could have gone, that's crazy. You know, you know, I haven't even been with a man. Well, it's going to be a virgin birth. Or like, that happens a lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on. Our minds get in the way of receiving this truth of Christ in you. There's no question about it. But she, but she, didn't, just, she didn't just say, okay, whatever you say. She didn't. Whatever you say, then, okay, I'm a zombie. Just tell me what to believe. I'm an idiot. You know? And she didn't say, no, that's too strange. It can't happen. It's too out of the realm of the order of the universe. What did she do? She pondered it. She held it before the Lord in her heart. It says she pondered these things in her heart. If it, you know, if something is true, the Lord will eventually show you. I remember a couple of things, man, I fought tooth and nail only for the Lord to show me it was true later. I think, I think Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, did that too. I think that, that's true too. All right, we need to quit. Well, let's take a break and uh, we will proceed to another room and another class with the, a similar voice. openness to the stranger.